Welcome to Canonical. I'm James Shaw, and I'm joined by Yad Darris and Sam Spieler. Hey. Hello. Hey, guys. Hope you guys are doing well. I'm drinking my mint green tea. I've got chamomile. Chamomile. I have an empty cup. Poverty times out here in Beijing. The guy in China is not drinking tea. <laughs> <laughs> so... Today, we are discussing the first book in our contemporary Chinese sci-fi series, The Three-Body Problem by Liu Cixin. If you're a first-time listener, do join our book club discussion on Reddit at Canonical Pod, and you can find that by clicking on the link in the episode description. You can find us on social media at Canonical Pod, and if you want to support us in your local bookstore, you can use our bookshop.org link, which you can find in our episode description as well. So in this conversation today, we'll be talking spoilers. If you don't want the ending spoiled for you because you haven't finished the book yet, you can check out our review episode, which was published last week. There are a lot of spoilers in this book, so if you don't mind spoilers, then you can keep on listening. Next week, we will review Vagabonds by Hao Jingfang. So before we start, I think we should talk a little bit about our connection to China now, I'm Chinese, but I'm Chinese-American. But I did live in China for a fairly substantial part of my adult life. I lived and worked in China. And Ied and Sam, you both have lived in China as well. Yeah. Ied is still there. Uh, I lived there briefly for under a year. Yeah, I think my experience of China, I'm still an outsider. I don't want to claim authority. I don't want to speak on other people's behalf because my experience is definitely limited. But I do watch China very carefully, and I do pay attention to what's going on in this country, not only because it affects me personally, but also because I think it's a tremendously important country in terms of you know, global politics. So I do keep up to date with what's going on and I have a personal connection just in terms of my marriage and the friends and family that I have here now. You're like that giant eye that folds into the third dimension. Yes. Yeah, and same for me. I mean, even though I am Chinese-American and my wife is also Chinese and I lived in China, I can't really claim to speak for Chinese people despite people sometimes ask me to do so. Um, I, I can't really do it because I didn't grow up in China, first of all. And, you know, my lived experience is quite different from people who did. I can speak to that the least among all three of you, having only spent about nine months there. But, yeah, I, I see China as a giant, either recognized or not fully recognized in its culture, its pop culture. And I think it's growing and isn't stopping anytime soon. I think we're going to see a lot more work like this in the future. So, Ied, why don't you start us off here with our discussion today? In the last episode, one of the things that we, I think, all kind of criticized the book for was the dry tone and the scientific exposition we find throughout. I think it's fair to say that Liu definitely prioritizes those over character and dialogue. I've heard him actually compared to Asimov in this respect, and I think it's a fair comparison. Also, my paperback copy of the novel has a quote on the cover from another very famous over-explainer, Kim Stanley Robinson. Uh, Robinson says that the three-body problem is the best kind of sci-fi. <laughs> I think that's definitely debatable, but that's what he thinks. Well, what does he mean by that? I, I really want to know. What does he mean by the best kind of sci-fi? Well, it's definitely that the best kind of sci-fi is as hard as possible. Yeah, that's you know. totally what Kim Stanley Robinson would say. He likes his sci-fi like he likes his men. <laughs> but my hypothesis about this novel is that Liu is a science fiction writer who cares more about science than fiction. In fact, I might even say he cares very little about fiction. And I think that his flat and technical style. And the content of this novel is a result of the society that he lives in and his readership or what he expected his readership to be. I read an essay about Chinese sci-fi by the sci-fi writer Han Song called Chinese Science Fiction, A Response to Modernization. In that essay, Han argues that 
sci-fi writing in China is still a marginal activity, and science fiction is perceived as inconsequential because it is unable to solve real-life problems. Uh, it seems true to me, given the criticism of the genre throughout the 20th century. I think, Sam, last week you mentioned that people thought of science fiction as a capitalist art form, right? Mm -hmm. But nowadays, I think that the government realizes that it can be more powerful than that. Even though sci-fi and pop culture can't solve problems, the government is aware that pop culture has a power to promote ideology. And the dominant ideology I see in China around me today is that of a technocratic society in love with the pragmatism of the scientific method. And I think that the government sees the potential for science fiction to promote that particular ideology. It follows then that the prescribed role for this science fiction in modern China is to promote this ideology, and the content and style of this famous novel seem to do exactly that. I think you're right, both in that uh, he definitely cares more about the science than the fiction. I think that shows. In fact, I think he has said as much in interviews. It seems like a vehicle for him, uh, but he's not interested in what kind of car it is. But I also think you're right about the view of science fiction is changing in China and that it is being seen as more of a way to promote ideology, um, not just basic propaganda, but also, I don't remember where I saw this, but I recall someone saying that China is not the same China as it was 50 years ago, and that whoever was speaking, and I really am pretty sure it was Leo, uh, that he sees China as a world leader and that they need to become more of a world leader and that he saw this as one way of promoting that idea. I think it's also significant that the writer I mentioned, Han Song, who wrote the overview, is what you might call a science skeptic. He's very skeptical of the rapid development of science and of technology in modern China. He thinks that it contradicts Chinese values at some fundamental level. And, you know, true to form, all of his books have been banned in China, whereas Louis Hsien is the <laughs> most famous Chinese sci-fi writer in the world. Do you think in this book, uh, Han Song's viewpoint might be represented by someone like Mike Evans? I'm not sure what Mike Evans is supposed to represent because he's so thinly drawn. He's a caricature, but a caricature of what? He's an argument, but because he's thin and because he's snuffed out, it's not much of an argument. It's an argument for welcoming another species, another dominant species, in defense of the Earth itself. But that idea doesn't really go anywhere because everyone gets killed. It doesn't really get explored. I think Leo positions us as readers against him. We're meant to see him as ridiculous. And even in the novel, Ye Wenjie, who's kind of a hero or closer to a hero than other people in the ETO, she also thinks he's kind of ridiculous, but partners with him because of his money, maybe. I don't think we are supposed to think of him as ridiculous because he's presented to us as a kind of hero by the villagers, but ultimately his heroism is for naught because, you know, they call him, I forget the whatever Chinese. Um, right. They call him Bethune because of Norman Bethune, who was the Canadian doctor who helped the communists mm -hmm, during right. the war. Yeah, I don't think he's supposed to be uh, an object of ridicule. I think he's supposed to be like someone who's a true believer. And in China, true believers are um, not really ridiculed, but it's a shame because they are kind of born in the wrong time almost. That's kind of the sense I get from him, like, or from how he's treated. Like, he's not successful, but it's not because he's foolish. I think the villagers who cut down the trees were portrayed more negatively. I would say that his foolishness is not necessarily that he's 
an evil person, but just a person who doesn't think things all the way through. His ideology seems kind of half-formed. And limited, probably. His thoughts seem to only extend to the idea of saving the Earth. Not Earthlings, but nature. I don't have much to say about this because I just generally agree. Like, I think the government in China is quite autocratic in a lot of ways. And they still employ quite a bit of central planning. So, of course, they'll be proponents of kinds of literature that reflect the morals and virtues that the government thinks is important for its citizens. That's true. But I guess the thing that I would want to interrogate then is if that being true is damning to Liu or to this novel, because it could be the case that he took direction from the government and the government prompted him to write in a certain way because they wanted these values to be out there. And if that were the case, would that ruin the novel for you? Well, I don't think that happened, but even if it did, I don't think it would ruin the novel for me. Um, you have people who are operating under censorship in different ways. I think some people are directed more forcefully to produce certain works, but it doesn't mean you can't evaluate the works. Like, I'm hoping that we can evaluate it even if he was under pressure from the government to write a certain work. I think we are trying to evaluate it as best as we can, and we'll probably take all this into consideration when we evaluate it. Ed, you mentioned that Ye was a hero of the book, right? I think that she is more sympathetic than somebody like Pan Han or Mike Evans. I think that because her loss of faith in humanity is grounded in something relatable, it's grounded in the death of her father, the murder of her father, we can understand it. And then when we see her renewed faith in humanity with her experience with the villagers, we can also understand that it doesn't seem like kind of bullshit ideology. It seems sincere. She is at odds with Wong and company, though, right? Who is also kind of our hero? I think that Ye Wenjie is more ambivalent. I think that in general, we can understand why she did the things that she did, even if we disagree. I think that Wang Miao is more of the typical hero. Like, we definitely side with him at the end of the novel, or at least we're meant to side with him. I don't think I would view him as a hero. This is kind of splitting hairs a bit, because in the strict sense of the word, I, I really think he's much more of a narrator, stranger in a strange land kind of character. I don't think he's much of a protagonist, actually. He's not very active. No, the way I'm using hero is more, yes, he's our main point of view for much of the book, but also he does represent the human's best interest, or at least what he thinks is the human's best interest. At the end of the novel, when uh, Da Shi gets him out of his despair and he shows him the locusts, and then they all agree to fight back against the Trisolarians, I think we're meant to feel something in our hearts at that moment. We're supposed to say like, yeah, we got to fight, you know? That's the feeling that I think Liu wants us to have, don't you? Yeah, yeah. It might not be enough to call him a hero, technically. Yeah, um, I'm just saying, like, on a technicality, I think Da Shi is more of a hero in the um, narrative sense. Like, he's the one who actually causes change to happen. And I don't like him as a character because I found him, like, very tropey. So <laughs> it's not something I want to advocate for. But I, I think he's more of the traditional hero, um, whereas Wang Miao is more of the narrator, like, Dr. Watson character. Mm. You know, going back to talking about whether or not Liu was taking notes from somebody at the government, I don't think sincerely that that happened. I think the reason why is because in the forward to the American edition of this novel, Liu writes that I have always felt the greatest and most beautiful stories in the history of humanity were not sung by wandering bards or written by playwrights and novelists, but told by science. The stories of science are far more magnificent, grand, involved, profound, thrilling, strange, terrifying, mysterious, 
and even emotional compared to the stories told by literature. I take him at his word when he says that. I don't doubt the sincerity. I also don't think that that attitude makes for a particularly good novel. I think that we can see the, the quality of his influences when it comes to his writing and the novel, and I think that statement really encapsulates the deficiencies with his prose. Well, also, I don't think he's right even in his own work. I mean, I, I think it's clear that he believes that, but the most compelling narrative is Yeowen Zia's, right? We, we have a lot more dramatic and emotional events happening in her historical background and, and what happens after, you know, toward the end of the novel. While the scientific passages were interesting, they are very flat. And even if he's showing that he cares more about the science, it's definitely not the best writing in the book. It smacks of the philosophers writing philosophical novels who want to focus on the philosophy. For me, it's exactly the same. I think if you're writing for an audience who's interested in philosophy, then that novel will be more successful. If you're writing for an audience, in this case, who are more interested in science than this novel will be more successful on that level for those people who are more interested in science. I'm sure there's some engineer or materials engineer, I guess, who's like orgasming over the description of the nanofibers or how um, reality is being folded or protons are being folded. I mean, I didn't. I skimmed it. But maybe the people who are in theoretical physics are overjoyed at that section. Well, that's just it. That's my that's my argument is that, you know, we as Americans, we don't live in a technocratic society. Our attitude towards science is much different from what I think would probably be Liu's imagined Chinese reader. I think he was writing for somebody who grew up in a Chinese technocratic society and has those values in his or her heart. I think for that reader, it matters much more that the science is shown on the page because that's the aspirational aspect of the novel. I wouldn't even go that far, though. I would say it's much narrower. It's not for the typical Chinese audience. It's for the scientist. Like, let's say, you know, your spouse, for example, your partner, she reads a lot of books, or at least she consumes a lot of uh, pop culture and movies, right? Like, do you think she would be really interested in these sections? I don't think my partner, who's also Chinese, would be. I think it's not a matter of interest, but perception of value. I think that in a technocratic society, you see science, you see technology, you may not personally have much affinity for them, you may not really understand them clearly, but your education and your upbringing shows you that these are the sources of real value in the world. And when you reject them, if you reject them, you feel guilty for doing it. You see your rejection of them or your disinterest in them as a personal shortcoming, where an American reader, I would say, would say, oh, this is nerdy stuff. I don't care about that. We should also put a pin in this discussion for our wrap-up episode, because I have a feeling we're going to be talking about this a lot with the next couple books as well. Yeah. And my position is not opposite of yours yet. I just think it's narrower. I agree that China is a very technocratic society, maybe not the youngest generation, but definitely the generation that Liu is a part of. He grew up with the post-cultural revolution generation where they believed that science was the way out, that it would solve all their problems. And I think people in that generation certainly think about science differently than how Americans think about science, but also how young people in China today think about science. But I would not go so far as to say that he's aiming for that crowd necessarily. I think the people who really would appreciate that would be the scientists because of the care that he took to describe everything. Well, let me ask both of you, who are the villains in this novel? I think almost everyone is a villain, everyone who isn't working with Wang Miao. Even Ye, who is sympathetic, I think is a villain. Mm -hmm. It's a surprise, but she's a villain. 
Um, she's a scientist. Uh, Mike Evans is a villain, billionaire, oil magnet heir, and environmentalist. And the Trisolarans. The Trisolarans, yeah, they're definitely villains. Um, they're so cartoonish in a way because of how, yeah. you know, yes, I mean, they're obvious villains, but I don't know what to really say about them. Yeah. What I want to say, though, is I think that the villainy of the human characters is much more substantial than the villainy of the Trisolarians, specifically because they're traitors. They have access to this ideology of science and they reject it. And I think it's substantial. I think that the idea of a traitor, specifically with the context of China in the 20th century, with the Cultural Revolution and the Sino-Japanese War is really important. And I think that it has a lot of resonance with a typical Chinese reader. Yeah, I think so. But I don't think that applies that well to uh, Ye's situation, because she actually uses science to betray humanity. But I agree. I think generally, yes. I think Ye is kind of a special case, because she's moved by emotion uh, and not rationality. That's what causes her to betray humans. I don't know if you would fold that into your overarching argument or not, but I just see her as a special case. I think that she is more complex than the other characters, but I still think that in general, there's a particular prescribed attitude towards science that is valorized in the novel and deviations from that in any case are seen as traitorous to humanity. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, Isaac Asimov earlier. And the interesting thing is, I've read a lot of Asimov, is even though Asimov was a scientist, and even though his sci-fi was kind of hard sci-fi, it wasn't especially technical. But despite that, he never forgot the human element. His stories are very human, I'd say. They are formed around very scientific ideas. But unlike Liu, I don't think you would ever read Asimov and think, oh, these people are not people. So to your point, yes, in a lot of ways, Liu is more technocratic in the way he constructs his world than even Asimov, who's considered to be, you know, a scientist writer. In fact, I think the analog I'd say is uh, the other writer you mentioned, Kim Stanley Robinson. This is like a Chinese Kim Stanley Robinson. Well, here I want to take a look at some other things that Liu has said in interviews. In an interview in The New Yorker, he said while he was uh, being given an award for one of his books that he didn't like the idea that fiction could serve as commentary on history or on current affairs. He said, the whole point is to escape the real world. And it bothers me a bit because what we've already been talking about here, and it makes me question what he had brought up, whether this is something that he's saying to placate the censors, or is it something he really believes? As an uh, aside, the science fiction giant Ursula K. Le Guin uh, said, this may explain why many people who do not read science fiction describe it as, quote, escapist. But when Question further, they admit they do not read it because it's so depressing. Almost anything carried to its logical extreme becomes depressing, if not carcinogenic. Fortunately, though, extrapolation is an element in science fiction. It isn't the name of the game by any means. So she's saying that pretty much the exact opposite, that the escape is only part of science fiction. It's not the main thrust. It shouldn't be the only thing going for it. But I still don't know if we are supposed to take Leo at his word. Should we be taking his work more seriously or what he says in interviews? Because his work seems to say something else. For example, we can look at the Trisolarans as an imperial West unable to fix its own societal issues and growth without consuming nearby life which makes Earth steadily and ever more rapidly growing stronger and more advanced as current day China. And that conclusion, without having read the other books, would say that the West cannot coexist with the East, uh, China specifically, 
and portrays the West as the constant aggressors, more advanced but increasingly stymied by our own unsolvable problem, just as they're stuck with three bodies. Is this book advocating then for an isolationist China, or are there other readings we can make here? So to your first question, Sam, whether we trust him, the writer, or him, the public persona, the one making these statements, I don't even know if it matters. Because one, I think any public figure in China has to be careful what they say. So I don't know how much truth you can place in that in any statement he makes one way or another. And then that same filter or that same lens of suspicion, you also have to place on his work because any work he produces has to get past the censors. So in a way, there's no way of knowing his true beliefs. Just like some of the characters in the book who have to be very political and careful. When you're reading the book, you feel like, yes, there's some inner truth. And my sense whenever I deal with Chinese writers or Chinese public figures is I feel the same way. I feel like there is some kind of hidden truth, but there's no way of knowing which is the more true to his true feelings, his work or his persona. It's unknowable. So it almost doesn't matter. I feel like you just have to take the work as it is and interpret whatever you want from it. Yeah. He did in that same New Yorker article also say something completely opposite of the escapist comment which was that the relationship between politics and science fiction cannot be underestimated, which seems to fly completely in the face of what he had said previously. But I have a second larger point when it comes to Liu. I want to make a comment about Chinese society as well, but I I won't extrapolate it from Liu, which is that I don't get the sense that even though he is a very well-read scientist, he obviously knows his science. I do not think that he is a philosopher or someone who thinks about the world that critically. He thinks about the world a scientist might, but a scientist isn't necessarily a philosopher or a political scientist. I don't think those skills are very developed in his writing or in his thinking, which you can see in his writing. I mean, you can kind of see that with the representation of his hero, Da Shi, like Someone who is a more critical thinker, I do not think would write that kind of character. The person who would write that kind of character is someone who views the world in a very black and white way almost. I don't know if it's because he's bought into propaganda. Like I said, it's unknowable. But what I can say is that the kind of person who would write this character is someone who thinks the world is simple enough that a police person can outsmart, (laughs) you know, experts. I do think it's definitely a politically motivated part of the novel. Uh, Again, I want to emphasize that when something is politically motivated, I don't think it's a damning criticism. I don't think it's fair to say that it's bad because it's politically motivated. I think that there is a game that he has to play, and part of the game is to include things that maybe don't matter much to him because that's what you have to do in order to get published and to say things that you might not actually believe because that's what's necessary to get published. Similar to the quote that you shared with us earlier, Sam, in the afterword to the American edition of The Three-Body Problem, he wrote, I do not use my fiction as a disguised way to criticize the reality of the present. So, you know, he's making these constant remarks about basically the political neutering of his work. It has no political import. Why is he so insistent on that? It seems like he's so insistent because there is such an obvious political reading out there. And it's so obvious that basically for him to stay in the game, he's got to cut that off. To my mind, I don't believe him at all. Like when he says that, I agree with James that it doesn't really matter because we can't know the truth, but my intuition, my gut feeling is that he's lying because you have to lie to play the game. But to be generous, I think we have to consider when he says stuff like this that he means it. And I think if he does mean it, I have to say it's kind of bullshit because whether or not he intended for a work to be political, 
an artist in society has a responsibility to the interpretations of their work. And the political interpretation of this novel is quite obvious, isn't it? Yeah, and I do want to talk more about that. Um, that's the second part of my question. But also, we can recognize that he is sensitive, at least, to how such statements would be portrayed, because he has publicly said he doesn't want to discuss his political feelings uh, in public. He's withdrawn from the public in that way as much as he can, while still being, you know, one of the most well-known Chinese writers. But anyway, what about that reading? Are there other readings we can take from that? Or is that it? I guess my one issue with the reading of the Trisalarans as uh, the imperialist West is it doesn't have to be. I mean, it's everywhere. There's always fiction about some imperialist oppressor. There's, I think it was an, an Atlantic article that talked about the obsession that science fiction writers have with colonialism in the West. Like American writers are always writing about colonialism. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the West trying to take over the East. It could just be a story of colonialism, like of a stronger state or a stronger group of people, group of beings trying to take over a weaker group of beings. It doesn't have to be a West-East parallel. That's true. Originally, when I first started reading the book, knowing what he had said in public, uh, I still thought that maybe the Trisolarans were China. Yes. That he was saying something about that. But I went back on that thought about halfway through. I haven't gone back on that thought yet. Like when you proposed that the Earth uh, citizens are China, I thought, well, that's the opposite of the way I read it. I do see the Trisolarans in this novel as being appropriately technocratic. I think that's echoing the values that I mentioned earlier in Chinese society. And I think that when Earth fails, if Earth fails, I think we could read it as a failure that's deserved, a failure due to kind of a decadent, indulgent society. And the Trisolarans are more of a hardworking, serious, dedicated society. And I think those kinds of values are very much resonant, I think, with the Chinese readership. And also, the Trisolarans, their government seems to be very autocratic. And everything's planned centrally. They can decide when someone gets dehydrated or not, or rehydrated. And when they're making those, um, what are they called? Sofans? The princep and his advisors can unilaterally decide to just you know, change the night sky and do something that might kill them all for the good of everybody. So in that way, it is very, very Chinese. Well, and also, though, uh, just to throw another thing in there, back to what you were saying earlier, James, it almost doesn't matter because when we start to see, what is it, maybe two thirds of the way through, we start to see Trisolarans through their eyes when we see the transmissions from Mike Evans' ship, uh, we start to see how their beginnings were just like ours, that their discovery of Earth was exactly the same as Earth's discovery of them. With a betrayal? With a betrayal, but everything about that whole time frame. Leo took pains, it seems, to make it almost exactly the same time frame, just the way everything played out. So in that way, it doesn't necessarily matter what they stand for. You're right that it's just colonialism. In that way, there isn't, like you were saying earlier as well, there isn't really a good guy here. They're, they're both villainous. Yeah. But I guess what I'm saying to Ied's point is the system of government and the ethos that they seem to embody seem very uh, communist China, autocratic China, even though, yes, like it could be any kind of colonial power. So we have two Chinas, really. 
Well, if I may make a general observation, I guess, is, and this is what I was saying earlier when, when I said I didn't want to extrapolate Liu onto China at large, but this is more of a general observation of China. I think that philosophically, China hasn't really moved much out of the 20th century. And the existential angst that China is facing feels very 20th century to me. And I don't mean this to denigrate people of China or like China as a whole. What I mean is like outside of China here, and I don't mean like everywhere outside of China, but like in the West, philosophically, the ideas that we are grappling with is different. Like we've moved on past this very Cold War kind of uh, existential angst that is still gripping people in China and that they still write about. Like we've moved on to different monsters and demons. It seems like they're still stuck in the mid 20th century fears. And so I see that in this book. I think you're right, but I think that the reason why we would like to perhaps not think about those things or talk about those things or consider those things perhaps part of history is because that's a history of opposition. And I think in the West, we would like to imagine that the battle is over and we've won. Whereas I think China and the Chinese model for statehood and global citizenship is adversarial to the idea of the Western liberal democracy. I think that they exist as a reminder that there is another way of doing things in the world. And because they're alone kind of in having the power to remind us of that, they do seem perhaps antiquated because they're the only ones who continue to remind us of that when, you know, Russia has no longer got the power and there aren't really any other superpowers in the world capable of doing that. You're talking politically here. And I think that's a part of it, especially when we think about the Trisolarans. But I'm not even really focusing so much on politics. I'm much more focusing on philosophy. Like, I think postmodernism, for example, hasn't really made its way to China. This kind of... Uh, Irony, for sure, but also general distrust hasn't really made its way to China. There is a distrust of the government, but it's it's different. It's a different kind of distrust, but more so irony, I suppose. If we just sort of wrap up what we think the Trisolarans are, where do you guys stand then? Because my stance is that I don't think it's necessarily China, but I think there's a lot of evidence pointing that way. I don't see as much evidence of it being the West, but I can see it as being either China or a generic colonizing power, not referring to China or the West. If this is a what if book, and I think it is, it seems to me that this is a what if there was a mirror version of us in space? What if there were a China in space? Grappling with similar issues, but under more dire circumstances. I guess the point I'm building toward here is from the New Yorker article, the profile of Liu, what I got from it is that he doesn't really get America. And that's fine because he's not from America, but he doesn't get, you know, when the writer says something like, um, you know, maybe you've been brainwashed by the by America, or she said she speculates that Liu thinks she's been brainwashed by America the same way she thinks he might have been brainwashed by China. I, I just think that he doesn't get the West because he grew up in China. He doesn't understand that there's a different perspective. Um, he knows there is a different perspective, but he doesn't understand that perspective. That's what I kind of am driving at here, that there is something missing here where we are expecting him to perhaps write in opposition to the government or we're expecting him to secretly be writing something uh, seditious, but I don't think he is. I think he's he just doesn't understand um, the philosophy of revolution, for example. I think if we think about Chinese philosophy, a lot of it is built around um, harmony and what is har harmony and how to create harmony and how do different parts of society work together. 
Like, is there a Chinese philosopher? And this is an honest question because I don't think there is. Is there a Chinese philosopher or philosophy for oppressed peoples? Because I don't think there is. Like, that's something that's missing from this way of thinking. Whereas in the West, you have a lot of ways of interrogating the world that try to achieve a certain kind of uh, revolution. I think in China, that kind of philosophy doesn't really exist, or at least it's not popularly promulgated. So it's hard for me to say that this, you know, even if we read the Trisolarns as the uh, contemporary Chinese government, I can't go so far as to say that this is a call to action of any sort, because I don't think this idea exists in China. I don't think he's calling, to, he's making a call to action, because I don't think that he has the requisite way of thinking about the world to do that, if that makes sense. Like, there's no philosophical discourse for revolution. That's what I'm getting at. I think there is certainly revolution based on need. Like, people are starving, and because of that, the government is bad. That exists. But I don't think there's that philosophical discourse of, well, perhaps the government need to negotiate these kinds of rights for its people. You know, like, I think that discourse, if it exists, it's in its very nascent stages. Well, even if we just look at this book on its own, I mean, we haven't read the other two books yet, but there isn't a call to action, like you said. There is no point so far. So far, it's just there's a, an external threat that is very similar to the internal threat, and that's it. And I'm not even necessarily bashing Liu in this situation or China in this situation. What I'm saying is um, I think we are trying to read something into this text that doesn't exist in the general populace in China. And because of that, I feel skeptical that it exists in Liu's mind and that he's trying to convey it. I'm sure there is someone in China, you know, those writers who are banned, who are thinking along those wavelengths. But I don't think Liu is one of those people. Uh, before we move on, I want to, you know, kind of put a pin in this because I think that the issue of who the Trisolarians and the Earthlings represent is probably unsolvable. But there is another political aspect of the novel is the representation of the Cultural Revolution. This is a kind of an open secret in China, like people talk about it, but you can only talk about it in certain ways. I'm wondering what sort of judgment you can see in this novel, or if there is any judgment at all in terms of the policies and the kind of the reverberant effects of that era of Chinese history. What I've seen in the book kind of mirrors other popular media in China, which is that the Cultural Revolution was bad, but notice none of the blame really goes to the people at the top. It's just bad because it's chaos. And I see that in this book because obviously the state of chaos that the trinary system imposes onto the Trisolarans, for me, is a very clear mirror of the state of chaos that Ye experiences in the Cultural Revolution. And so you can kind of see that for people in the Cultural Revolution, it's like that state of chaos. Well, and as we discussed in the last episode, there was that whole section where we have for not really any narrative gain, this big defense explanation by the former Red Guards that we were doing what we thought was right and you can't blame us for anything. And even, yeah, just kind of, she wanted answers and, and she wanted, I don't know, revenge, but by the end of their statements, she just, I forget exactly, but I, she pitied them, I think, and no, didn't blame them? No, I don't think she them. pitied them. I think um, it ends with her feeling even more dispirited because she was hoping they would apologize, but they didn't. Right. But I think what I got from it is she was expecting some kind of apology. And what she got instead was our life is as bad as or worse than yours. So why do you want us to apologize? So... We read this after our series on posthumanism, and I'd like to take some time to discuss the posthumanist aspects of this book, if there are any. What seems to be the most obvious posthumanist aspect of this book is the ETO's betrayal of humanity in favor of 
the non-human in this book, the Trisolarans. So uh, roughly speaking, there are three factions here. The Adventists, who believe that humans need to be destroyed because they have proven to be incapable stewards of the natural world. Then you have the Redemptionists, who believe that humans should collaborate and assist the Trisolarans by solving the three-body problem. And then you also have the Survivors, who are much more of a niche group, I suppose, because they don't really pop up that much in the book. But they are collaborating with the Trisolarans in order to save themselves when doom inevitably comes to humanity. And then, yeah, she doesn't really fit in because she, it seems that she initially believes that humans are beyond saving because of her personal trauma due to the Cultural Revolution. But then later in the book, it's clarified that she wishes Trisolarans to rule over and guide humanity. I think she says this when she's being interviewed by her captors. So setting aside whether or not you think Liu did a good job establishing these views, which I, I think all three of us would say that not really, do you think these rationales for why someone would portray humanity to be believable or justifiable? And I'd say like the real caveat here is setting aside whether Liu did a good job establishing these views, because I think it's very difficult to set that aside, because I don't think he did a good job uh, establishing the views and making them um, very sympathetic in any way. Do you think, like, for example, the Adventists, these um, eco-terrorists, you might say, that's the analog here, like, do you think people would go so far as to kill all of humanity? People who believe that humans are destroying the natural world? Because I don't really believe that. I don't think so. I, it seems pretty thin to me. If we look at Ye Wenzia, the biggest thing that happened to her, personally, was the death of her father at the hands of the Red Guards and her mother. And she was alive long enough to see other atrocities, uh, specifically of the Cultural Revolution, but also of the rest of humanity. It seems really psychopathic to jump from that to all Earth, all humans deserve to be killed off. That seems true for the other factions as well. It's a huge leap to go from that or from we're destroying the planet to, well, we better kill all humans. It's a really big leap. Yeah. And that's where I'm at. I think that you might be looking for something in the novel that doesn't exist. It's not supposed to be there. Um, my reading is that these different factions are hyperbolic examples and they're hyperbolic because it's meant to be a kind of social criticism. I think it de it definitely parallels the cultural revolution that we see earlier in the novel. In chapter 29, I think we have the most clear kind of explanation of the ETO and how it operates. On uh, page 255 in my copy, there is a quote that they concluded that the common people did not seem to have the comprehensive and deep understanding of the highly educated about the dark side of humanity. Their thoughts were not as deeply influenced by modern science and philosophy. Uh, this, to my mind, it brings up the idea in the Cultural Revolution of the common people being somehow pure and the educated people being traitorous and their education leading them astray from kind of pure and wholesome knowledge. In cultural revolution terms, the pure, innocent proletariat were called the red categories. There were five red categories, and then there were five black categories of people who are anti-revolutionary. So I think we see a parallel there. Later on, we see that, this is on page 255 as well, most of the members had a high social status. They held a lot of power and influence. I think this is social criticism in the sense that Liu might be kind of showing us to beware of celebrity culture and beware of influencers. And then finally on 257, there's this passage. It says, the main path of spreading trisolarian culture to society was the three-body game. So this is pointing to the dangers of pop culture. I think in general, 
you know, China in modern times has had trouble with cults of different sorts. And I think that we're supposed to read this in a hyperbolic way because we're meant to see very clearly that this ETO is just another cult. And it's maybe not a call to arms, but more of a warning message. I think it's meant to be easy to understand. And because of that reason, it's exaggerated. I don't think you're wrong. I just don't know that it makes for good fiction. <laughs> it, well, it kind of goes to what I was going to say next, which is that even though this seems like a post-human novel, I don't think it is because I don't think its soul, if there is one for a novel, is post-human. It's arguing for a kind of humanism, right? I think it's arguing for us. It's arguing for the reader who identifies as human, but it's not specifically human. If we were a bunch of dolphins, it would be a dolphin novel. If we were a bunch of gorillas, it would be gorilla novel. I think that the worldview of the author is basically whatever's good for us is good. By us, you mean society at large? Well, whoever's writing the novel and whoever's reading the novel, because it's a novel written by and for human beings, I would say that humanism is kind of by default a good thing. I don't think the idea that something could be good outside of being good for us has entered Leo's mind. So are we in agreement here then that even though this book appears or dresses up as a kind of post-human premise, it's not actually a post-human novel, at least in book one? I, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, I tend to agree with the kind of postmodern idea that the authorial intent doesn't matter so much. And, you know, a, a text is a site for interpretation. And you can interpret this novel as a post-human novel. I don't know that I would say Leo thinks that way, and I don't know if I think that way, but I definitely see how somebody else could. How do you think a person, a reader, would do that? What, what case would they make? I could see the VR actually being a, um, something that perhaps you could say is post-human in the way that it reinterprets history, in the way that it teaches, I guess, and how people interact with technology. I could see that in uh, Haraway's article that we discussed previously. I could also see the Sophons in how powerful they are, and it's hinted that they are quite intelligent. I could see that as being a post-human aspect of the novel. What I would say makes it post-human is the ambivalence about whether or not the Trisolarans or the humans are morally right. Because in the beginning of the novel, I think the kind of naive intuition that a reader would have is that humans are good enemies of humans are bad. Then we kind of see the cultural revolution, and we see the destruction of the earth, and we say, well, humans are bad. Therefore, somebody who can take over for us is probably good. I think that's probably like Ye Wenjie and Mike Evans' point of view. But then we go back to seeing how the Trisolarans are going to come to this planet and just kill all of us and replace us on this planet. And then we say, well, their destruction of our species is no better than our destruction of the sparrows that Mike Evans is trying to save. So in fact, there is no real moral high ground to be found. And the entire universe is just a matter of taking what you need. There is a kind of moral neutrality to the survival mechanism that I think makes it post-human, but it doesn't have the attitude that I think you're looking for. It doesn't argue in favor of post-humanism, but rather it raises post-humanist themes. Mm -hmm. Something we brought up in the Fire Upon the Deep in that discussion, and of course this is not in that series, but we talked about how the aliens in that book seemed very human. And I would say the same thing here about the Trisolarans. Right. But I think that's part of the point too. Whereas I don't think that was the point in A Fire Upon the Deep. All right, let's take a break now. We'll be right back. 
Welcome back. So Liu is by far the most famous modern Chinese writer, sci-fi or otherwise. What role do you think this novel has in setting the tone for Chinese sci-fi and how it's received globally? I think it's quite a tough place for him to be in because I think it's natural when you have a sample of one novel, you know, when most American readers have only read one Chinese novel, anything they read after this is going to be compared to this novel. I don't think that he wants that position, but I think, unfortunately, he's in that position in terms of a global audience. It's not fair to him, but it's also an opportunity. If he's a very patriotic person, he can use his position now to promote Chinese sci-fi and Chinese attitudes and Chinese ways of thinking on a global stage, but I'm not really sure if that's his attitude or not. I get the sense that he didn't necessarily mean for that to happen, but that he is embracing it. Again, this points back to what we were talking about earlier, his statements on fiction and not look too deeply at the politics within. But it sure seems to me like he's happy to use this as a platform, not just for himself, but for the exposure of more Chinese fiction and science fiction. What's interesting to me is when I read this book, it does seem very different from other science fiction that is not written by a Chinese writer. If we compare this to the three previous books that we've read, which are not written by Chinese writers, this is different in, well, perhaps tone and feeling, but also in the philosophical approach that I talked about today in this episode. And if I were to read this as the first Chinese sci-fi novel, and I think it might be my first Chinese sci-fi novel, I think my expectations are actually higher, that I expect to read something different, different for, from other science fiction that I've become accustomed to that are written by non-Chinese writers. Do you guys feel the same way, that there's something different about this novel? Yes. I think the historical aspect of the Cultural Revolution specifically makes it very different in a really interesting way. I really enjoyed that. And I asked off air, I wasn't going to bring it up, but I asked if you guys thought in the other books, if that aspect would be present, because that was one of the, the things that really drew me to this book as feeling different from other science fiction. In terms of a Western analog, though, is there somebody that you could compare Leo to? Does he belong in the same category as a modern or postmodern sort of sci-fi writer? Is he a Philip K. Dick sort, or is he an Asimov sort, like I mentioned earlier? I think he's much closer to Asimov, which is, once again, um, it's similar to what I was saying about this way of thinking as being kind of a mid-20th century way of thinking. It's not very postmodern in that way. The reason why I ask is there is an article um, after 1989, The New Wave of Chinese Science Fiction, by uh, Chinese academic Song Mingwei. And her argument is that after 1989, Chinese science fiction changed because the kind of sincere utopian attitude from before 1989 had to change and it had to be tempered into a much more muddled point of view. And in the article, Song basically says that even though Liu Cixin came to prominence after 1989, he's kind of out of step with his peers. He has a more sincere attitude towards progress. And she says that he hearkens back towards the golden age of science fiction. We're talking more like people like Asimov than, you know, more postmodern takes. And basically what I'm wondering here is if Liu Cixin becomes so popular with this kind of more traditional novel and he's globally known, is this going to inspire imitators who have a similarly maybe naive worldview or a similarly traditional worldview? So by traditional or naive, what you mean is non-confrontational, right? 
not necessarily non-confrontational, but in terms of the article that I mentioned, it would be sincere and with a, a sincere moral perspective. I think that in the three-body problem, there is some ambivalence, but the sincerity is that what's good for Earth is good, and what's good for human beings is good, and because we're humans, this is what we should do. And, you know, there are lots of counterexamples in her article that I think are worth exploring. Perhaps we can talk more about it on Reddit, but she does offer quite a few other examples post-1989 that seem much more nuanced and complicated than this novel. Okay, well, sounds like we have a lot to look forward to with our other two books. Let's stop here with this episode. Thank you for listening. Next week, we will review Vagabonds by Hao Jingfang, our second book for this series on contemporary Chinese sci-fi. We've also got an updated reading schedule, which you can find on Reddit at Canonical Pod, where we also post threads for our book club discussion every week. If you would like to talk about the topics we just discussed or about Chinese sci-fi in general, you can find us there, and we'd love to hear your thoughts. So please come on by. Till next time, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.